Senator, Lo Senator Long, on a point of personal privilege. May I give Senator Long your attention, please? Members, if I could have your attention just for a moment. You know from time to time there are great needs that we have among the uh, body. And I want to call to your attention, and we're going to pray in just a moment, uh, Senator Don Hines, who has chaired uh, great leadership positions, including the president of our Senate, uh, is having some major health issues. And uh, it is a uh, major issue. Uh, but also, I wanted to let you know that our former governor, Governor Kathleen Blanco, uh, is under hospice care. And for those of us who have gone through uh, this experience, uh, I can tell you it's a very emotional, uh, it's a very um, difficult time for families. I don't know anything else to do but to come to you and tell you that in my greatest need, you prayed for me. And I think it's biblical, and I think it's practical that we pray for those that we know, that we love, and that have served us together. I would also remind you that Senator Boudreaux, while he was here doing the work of a senator, his daughter is an MD Anderson, continuing to take uh, uh, treatment for, for cancer. So I would ask if you would stand uh, and allow me just to take a moment as we enter this holy week to call upon the name that is absolutely worthy to be honored and ask that God would step in and do something special. Would you take the hand of the senator who's next to you? Uh, I think, I think we, we gain each other. We gain strength when we do that. Join me as we pray. Eternal Father, our hope is in medicine. It's in the provisions that you have provided here on earth. But our greatest hope is in the fact that you know us, that you love us, and that you hold close and you provide for those who have great needs. What a wonderful lady that served our state as governor. Now her family deals with some pressing health issues. For Senator Don Hines, what a gentleman. One who always took the high road of providing for his people. For Senator Boudreau and his family, Father, we come to you in your name. We ask that you would intervene and do what you can only do. So as we celebrate the resurrection of our Savior on Sunday, remind us that you're still active in the lives of your people. We thank you for loving us, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Representative Jones on personal privilege. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and colleagues. I want to say something to you today about former Governor Kathleen Blanco. Governor Blanco was a member of this House back in the 1980s. And as you all know, she has been struggling of late with cancer. She's been very forward about it and very out front. But she's fought it. She's fought it courageously and continues to do so. I just thought it was fitting. The Senate on the other side has recognized her a couple of times now, and, and I think it's fitting that in this House that we do. But I hope that you will indulge me just for a minute, because she left this House and went on to the Public Service Commission and then Lieutenant Governor and then Governor of the State, which was quite a f fate for anyone to do it regardless of who you are or where you're from. I first met Kathleen Blanco in 1968, along with Coach Blanco on Mud Bayou in St. Mary Parish, where we went duck hunting. She was a better shot than all of us. She could probably outshoot Representative Miguez. I bury your parish. It was in one of those times when she wasn't there, and I may have told this story a couple of times. It was late at night, I guess I was 19 or 20 years old. 
the lights had gone off, Coach was on the top bunk, and some of the other guys from UL was, was there. And I blurted out, I want everybody in here to know one day soon I'm going to be mayor of Franklin. The whole place exploded in laughter. Coach started jumping around in his bed so much that the bed broke and fell on top of Coach Falkenberry. He jumps up, he turned the light on, and he stuck it in my face. He said, son, you have as much chance of those blue bloods and Franklin letting you be mayor as my wife has to be governor of Louisiana. <laughs> that is a true story. <laughs> I had the good fortune when Governor Blanco got elected, she called me and said, you need to stop being mayor and come to work for me. I said, and Governor, do what? She said, well, come up here and help me fix all the things you've been stopping at my house for years bitching about. <laughs> I said, fair enough. Let's do it. And I guess what eventually happened, the good work that she was doing eventually got overshadowed by the hurricane, Hurricane Katrina and Rita. Once Katrina came, it was all hurricane. But I want to set the record straight on a few things. I was on my way back home from Chicago, having brought my daughter, who's sitting in the back of the room today, having brought her to Loyola to Chicago to start the fall session, and began to hear about the storm and made an effort to get back here as fast as I could. On the way back in on that Sunday night, the storm hit in the wee hours of Monday morning. When I got to Jackson, Mississippi, I met the biggest volume of humanity I have ever seen coming at me, where the contraflow, where we turned the highways into all outbound so people could get out. Went through the contra flow, went through the, uh, the, the normal flow of both highways working, and then got to the part where it was contra flow somewhere around Bellhaven. I stopped in and pulled in at a store, and it was just a mass of people that had left New Orleans. I remember distinctly a pickup truck with a cover on the back of it. It must have had 20 kids in it. And one of the kids told me, I said, what are y'all doing? Y'all evacuating? Yeah, mister, we're going to be out of school for two days. Said, if only. Actually, Garrett Graves was here earlier, and I commend him for his good work on, with the, on, on funding our levees and all. Because if those levees wouldn't have broke, it would have been a two-day storm. That changed everything. But in the 36 hours of the ordered evacuation, 1.3 million people were evacuated from this, from the area in 36 hours without incident. That is five times more people than Churchill got out of Dunkirk in two weeks. It was a massive, massive movement and a massive success. It was just 30 days later when in Texas they tried to evacuate and I think they had 30 deaths running away from Rita. The structure that was put together and how it worked was excellent. But as soon as we knew the levees were broke, had broken, the planning that had gone on, every asset that Governor Blanco had at hand, 400 wildlife and fishery boats were set up all around the city. Every piece of equipment that the National Guard had was set up around the city every piece that wasn't in Iraq because we were short. Some of our stuff was over in Iraq and some of our soldiers were there. To a person, man and woman, everybody went to work immediately. General Hunt Downer was there directing it in the Ninth Ward where the boats actually came up off of the, off of the trailers and floated up to the top. From that Monday evening, to the, to the Tuesday morning, Governor Blanco came to know, and look, some of this has never been in a book, some of this has never been in the newspaper. This is inside, and she didn't like talking about it a whole lot. Every asset that we had was done. She called, called me in and said, look, we're expended of everything we have. There, we have no more assets. We, we have to do something. 
I need you and Ty Bromell. Ty and I work together. Yes, that's true. Uh, for those of you who know Ty, uh, he worked for me. Uh, we started calling around, and there, there's always been this talk about where did the Cajun Navy start. That's the night the Cajun Navy started. From her thoughtfulness and her direction for us to call people, and some of the first people we called was Sarah Roberts and her husband Andy Buisson from Lake Charles, and a guy named Ronnie Lovett who financed entirely a whole troop of boats that came the next day and began to fish people out of the water. The following day, Senator Nick Gotro and Senator Rob Mariano produced 400 boats from Lafayette and from Iberville Parish and from these areas and went and just started fishing people out of the water. Governor Blanco knew that we had 72 hours to get to people who were diabetic because they would be out of their insulin and insulin shock would set in and, and they would die. She knew that the heat at 95 degrees was just devastating for elderly. And she did not sleep more than two hours in those, each of those two nights while worrying about the people out there. Those are things you'll never see on camera, but I saw them. I saw her concern, I saw her exhaustion. On Thursday evening at four o'clock, Ty Bromell and I brought what we thought was more of the buses that had come in from other states to Algiers Point to pick up more evacuees, but it's at that point that we realized that the mass evac evacuation of those who had remained and had been flooded out had actually, in, in essence, been completed. Two days later, two days later, our own military showed up after it was done, and all the arguing that went on about who's in charge of it, it was really, it was really pointless. The hard work had been done both by the people who worked for her in the government, but especially the citizens of this state who responded to that call and showed the world who we are. But she deserves credit for it to be known. She's the real admiral of the Cajun Navy. As I came back that day from the evacuation, it, as I mentioned, it, it looked like an army had come through. But the hard work then began but it was at that point, on that Thursday night, when we got back to the EOC, we had two buses in the back of the EOC. One, we called it the Brown Pelican, one was the White Pelican. And the governor would stay in, in them in the evenings and, and rest, which was not very much or very often. But it was about midnight, and I had a chance to see the television and all the yak yakking that was coming out of Washington and New York. And, all the terrible things that were being said, all the misinformation that was being said. And I, I had a moment with her alone. It was just after midnight. And I said, Governor, I said, I don't know if you've had a chance to watch television, but they're smashing you all over this country. They're smashing you all over the local news and everything. And, and, and I said, you know, if it, it, it's, it's probably going to really impact you politically to where you may be wounded Marley politically. She, she stopped and she looked at me in the calmest way and said, I know that. I said, but I'm not worried about the next damn job. I'm worried about the one I got. <laughs> that crystallized it for me. And I already loved her, but I loved her even more, respected her even more. And that was the way she went after it. Then came the road home, an idea which was a good idea. If only you could get the federal government out of the middle of it. Just send the check and let us take care of business. We did the program the way they said it. Then they sent back and said, well, no, we need to change it this way. And then they sent it back and said, no, we changed it this way. That went on about five or six times. So finally she realized there was too much politics in it and all and went to Washington and had just a throwdown and did have the chance to really work some things out with President George W. Bush, who they have remained friends. 
He's called her recently. Um, worked some things out to where we cut some of those strings and, and, and applied the effort. The contractor that was hired, she made it my job to beat on them every day. These are our people. They need the money. They need it now because we're devastated. Finally, within the last 18 months, we were able to push on them. I, I guess the, the contractors got so mad at me, but you know, I didn't care. I'd call them every night and said, you know, you just can't keep beating on us like this. Man, you don't know what a beating is until you go out and see what our folks are going through. We were able to process, she was able to process, 94,000 road home checks. That program is still technically not closed, but through the good work of helpers like Walt LeJay's father who was on the radio every Wednesday explaining to people how to apply and what to do with that process. The good citizens of this state that she brought together. Governor Blanco was all about education. She, f she followed the path that Mike Foster set. Mike Foster was a very good education governor. He wanted to bring teacher pay to the Southern Regional Average. He didn't quite get there, but she got there and followed, uh, followed his plans, fully funded the higher education formulary, and a number of good things like that. And, and I think sometimes we need to be reminded that regardless of party, regardless of what part of the state you're from, regardless of race, gender, anything like that, we've had some good leaders and, and, and we need to give them credit. No one needs it more now than she does. She's, she's struggling greatly, but she's a fighter. She hasn't given up on anything, but I would ask you today to join with me and ask Almighty God to do what he can and what he chooses and what his will be, but to think about her in the way that those of us know her and love her best, and I would ask that you would just stand and pray your own prayer for a really great lady. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Representative Jones. We love you, Governor.